Okay, welcome back everyone. Apologies for those technical difficulties. It seems virtual. I mean, we're all still learning as hard as we try to stay within the time frame. Um, so for anyone, thank you very much for being patient with us. Thanks for being no. ready for your presentation. No problem. Um, please go ahead. Okay. Great, thanks. But hi, everyone. Um, my talk is going to be on the in vitro propagation of Lipia javanica, a medicinally important plant. Lipia javanica is a highly valued medicinal plant in South Africa, and it is used to treat respiratory-related illnesses. The demand for its plant parts poses a threat to the wild populations, as overharvesting in the wild has been reported. Therefore, an alternate supply of plant material is needed. Plant tissue culture in this regard is an important and useful technique for mass propagation of this species as it is conducted under controlled conditions and it ensures a continuous supply of plant material throughout the year without having a negative impact to the plants that grow in the natural environment. Currently, there are no available reports on tissue culture of Libya javanica species that occur in South Africa. Therefore, the aim of the study was to develop an efficient protocol for in vitro propagation of Libya Javanica. Next slide, please. Now, this was done through direct organogenesis where nodal explants with auxiliary parts were used. And 80% of the nodal explants that were cultured on PGR free Morishigan Skook medium produced the highest number of multiple auxiliary shoots with an average of 4.5 shoots. Per explant and 7.1 nodes per shoot after four weeks of culture. These newly uh, formed auxiliary uh, shoots, about 70% of them produced adventitious shoots, uh, rather adventitious roots with an average of 3.1 roots per shoot and were successfully hardened. We also noted that the addition of oxen in the culture media resulted in hyperhydric shoots. Next slide, please. Indirect organ organogenesis was also conducted where leaf, leaf explants were used and 100% of colors formation was observed in all the tested um, treatments. However, no somatic embryo development was observed. Two types of Kylie, however, were observed in this study. We have got uh, the white, friable, creamy colors and the brown colors, which are going to literature they can be useful as source of, of plant material for the, to maximize the production of secondary metabolites. To summarize, plant regeneration through direct organogenesis was successful and in vitro plant, rather in vitro derived plant parts could be used for medicinal purposes, therefore uh, reducing the pressure, the harvesting pressure of these plants in the wild. Indirect organogenesis, where colors uh, was developed, which was found that it was not in embryogenic. However, the colors could be useful industrially for the production of phytochemicals, as in literature is indicated that Lipia javanica contains phytochemicals with high antioxidant activity. Further studies that are currently that will be will be currently conducted that will be conducted will be to determine the phytochemical profile of in vitro derived plant parts either through direct organogenesis or indirect organogenesis of Lipia javanica compared with those plants that are occurring in the wild and also to assess this plant these in vitro derived plant parts to, to assess their antioxidant and antimicrobial activities compared with those that occur in the wild thank you Thank you for that, Philemon. That's a very interesting talk. Are there any questions? Maybe while we wait, I'm just wondering, um, for other groups that where this has been done, has the phytochemical profile been similar between organogen? What is it? Organogenetically grown material. Uh, for currently, there are no available reports on the phy phytochemical analysis of it. Tissue culture produced, uh, tissue culture produced plants of Lipia, Lipia javanica. Right, and but for yes. other species, I mean, you know, 
Do you expect uh, that, to find a similar profile based on, on the literature for other groups or is it often quite different? Um, we expect to find, especially with in, 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 in organi doing direct organogenesis, we expect to find a slight different uh, phytochemical profile given the physiological um, changes that happens through that. Right. Yes. Right. However, we also expect the the production of secondary metabolites to be more in the from derived from the derived uh, tissue culture derived um, plant material as they're, con they're grown in controlled conditions as opposed to those in the wild where they face various um, uh, seasonal variations and temperatures. Oh right! Oh, fantastic! Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No, it seems not. We may come back to you if there some crop up or okay. just if you check in the question and answers. Thank you so much, Philemon. Okay, thank you. Great. So we'll move on to our last speaker, uh, which is Kaletso Semeko. Um, we'll just see. Let me just check my chat. Sorry. Just give and Kaletso we, a few Yeah, I've sent the request yeah. through, um, but I know that she has got some connectivity issues today. So, Kaletso, if you can hear this, if you can just accept the prompt, please. We'll give it a, a minute or two. Yeah, sure. I mean, in the meantime, if there are any questions for any of the speakers that, that have come to mind now, please feel free to post them in the question and answer session. They can either respond to you via that platform or we can invite them back up to answer verbally. So it doesn't look very promising, Angela. And none of the other speakers, the three that weren't here, they're not present at the moment, right? I, guess I see not. I see a post from Glynis saying, hi, Anthony, please see okay. bottom of Q&A for, for new questions. If you just scroll down, there are a couple of ones yeah. there. Maybe you want to work from the bottom up. Have you answered right. those? Um, I see that sometimes they pop up without notifying me. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Glynis. I'll do that. Um, I'm, I'm afraid we're not having any joy. With, um, okay. With, yeah, I think she's on 3G. So apologies that we couldn't hear your talk, but um, I'm listing out for presenters for you for Q&A. Yeah, so maybe I see that last question is for Philemon, if he can maybe come back on. Philemon, are you available? If you turn on your camera, I think you should come up onto the main screen. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, so there's a question here that said, what would be done with the end products? Example, what would they be distributed to various users? Would they be distributed to various users? So, Yes. Um, first, the, the, the end product would be for for this methodology to be applicable industrially for product development so that um, we as the compounds are and they've got high anti antioxidant activity they can replace those that are synthetically made in the lab right that is the potential that it has so what are they currently used for the the Okay, the, the, the plant yeah, itself, yeah. the plant itself, it, 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 it's used to, to treat um, flu-like re related um, uh, symptoms as well as other respiratory um, Ill, uh, illnesses such as it's TB and then and bronchitis as well as um, also, they're also it's used in, in, in malaria studies as well. Okay, okay. And that's yes. leaf material that's used. Mostly, it's leaf material. However, with the with 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 the with the 
colors, the, the colors cultures, we are hoping that it would have a similar profile with as the leaves that that can also be applicable for industrial application for product development. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Bloom. I think Thanks. does that answer the question? Anything to, to add to that? No. No. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks, Philemon. Thanks. And then I see there were two more questions, which I see were answered, but maybe there was a question to Carabo and one to Reshvi. I see they did answer it online, but I'm not sure if either of them wants to elaborate on that a little bit further. No, so unless I'm missing any more questions, I can't see any others that haven't been answered. Sorry, was there someone trying to join into the session now? I just see... That Suane Ludic is now back in the room um, and was supposed to present earlier. So, uh, so I've sent a request to, to Suane Ludic. Let's see if she can also maybe present. Yeah. yeah, we have some more time in the session, so we could put in one more. Hi, guys. Sorry, I was struggling with my internet. <laughs> so, sorry, Hi, so. internet. No problem. Welcome. Are you able to present your to share your slide? Uh, yes, let me just find it quickly. <clears throat> okay. So that's... Um, Screen share. Yeah. Okay, can select I window. Watch? Okay, we can see it. it's not in full presentation mode, but it's fine. I think we can still is it, is it, is it it's fine work with this. There we go. go. Well done. Go. Okay. Okay. okay, great. Be I'm great. just going to put off my time. camera in in case the Wi Fi goes down again. Um, okay. My name is Ludic. Um, the project I'm presenting was titled um, Ecophysiological Health Status of Oaks or Cracus Robert in Port of Sturm. So, when thinking of Port of Sturm, many of us imagine glorious oak trees next to the university. The Oak Avenue in Port of Sturm was planted in 1910 and has since been declared as a national heritage site for our um, country. But since then, these trees are dying. So this study aimed to determine whether an impervious surfaces, such as pavement or asphalt, which are typical of urban areas, have negative influences on the vitality of the trees in this avenue in terms of their water and nutrient content. So, in contrast with the general assumption, results revealed no water deficit in trees with dominant land cover of an impervious surface such as pavement or asphalt. There was also no statistical uh, correlation between visual dieback and physiological data. Now, despite this lack of correlation, five trees in the study area were identified as being in potential danger of mechanical failure in the near future due to a low visual vitality. In terms of the physiological data, chlorophyll fluorescence is between trees with impervious surface as land cover compared to um, other trees. So here on the right, we just have an example of a healthy tree versus um, a tree with a low visual vitality, as can be seen below. Then 
low proline levels were found, so the low proline concentration in trees confirmed the absence of water deficit stress in these trees. And then nutrient analysis also revealed neither a toxicity or a deficiency of any nutrients in these trees. So it was found that it is thus not water content, nutrient deficit or toxicity leading to a decline in vitality of the trees. And in conclusion, other factors causing tree dieback should be considered. Now these factors can be categorized following what is called the Mannion decline spiral and include predisposing factors, including the effect of age and air pollution, inciting factors such as defoliating insects, and contributing factors such as canker fungi and parasites. So if we determine whether these factors, um, what these factors are and whether they influence tree vitality, this will contribute to the drafting of a workable conservation and management plan in order to preserve the trees for future generations and maintain the beautiful aesthetic value as well as ecosystem services provided by these trees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? I wonder maybe just to start you off, what did you do you have any idea of what, what these other contributing factors might be just from having yes, so worked with this plant? You're looking at that, the yeah, that maybe um there are a lot of uh, herbivorous uh, insects that are living on the trees at the moment, um, which fell outside the scope of this study. So we can study them at the moment, but um, we definitely think they could have a huge effect on the vitality of the trees. And um, yeah, that I think it, it might have an effect that has been understated in the previous years. Yeah. Right. Great. So there are two other questions. So one from Glynn is, how did you establish that there was no water deficit in the trees in this Oak Avenue? Okay, so what we did is we determined that uh, water content within the trees, we determined it over a few sets um, of water potential we measured. And we determined that the lowest water potential was um, at a water potential of minus 1.2 um, megapascal. And it has been found that minus one is not deficit for any tree. It is merely the the only statistical di difference we could find was that water potential in trees with impervious surfaces was lower than other trees, but this was still not nearly low enough to indicate a water deficit. So water deficit usually only occurs at around three minus three megapascals, and our value wasn't even half of that. So that's how we determined that there was no water deficit. And in comparison to the those those trees growing in areas that weren't, you know, that went under these impervious services, was that comparable within the range? Yeah, it was. It was all in the range. Um, in Some difference somewhere between zero and minus one megapascal. So, um, even though they were statistically lower, um, as I said, they they were not low enough to indicate a deficit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then there's a question here. How is visual dieback, the method of visual dieback, how is that performed? What is that method? So we um, performed a few, um, we used a few methods and those include um, Calo et al's um, method of just visual. Um, we, we use the scale. Use where on a scale of one to seven or one to five, um, the details are are written down. But um, yeah, we just used it um, at the same day by the same um, researchers. We um, determined whether some trees were others were not doing as well um, in terms of the crown, the leaves, and the um, overall canopy um, of each tree. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Let me just check. Are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, there is. Uh, so there's a question. What about shot hole borer? Did you observe any tiny holes in the bark of the trees? 
So this is a question I get asked a lot because um, the Shatal Gora is a very serious problem in our country now. And everyone always wants to know if we found Shatal Goras, but we didn't. Um, we we never found them. And I don't know if they just haven't made their way to Bush of Sturm yet. I don't know. But um, they were not in our study. I think it's, it's a very important... Uh, I think we've just give it a few seconds. So and it really doesn't want to answer that question. I think that's what's happening here. Okay. I think we're going to call it a wrap for this session. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and we'll see you at the next session tomorrow. Have a good evening. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Bye.